Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. And today's guest, Paul Marion, is someone I am very much looking forward to speaking with. In fact, when I first came up with the idea for this project, more than one person told me right away that I absolutely had to try to connect with Paul. Paul has been a writer and a community activist since the 1970s. He's the author of several collections of poetry. He's actually an editor of the early works of Jack Kerouac. And as an administrator from the United States Department of the Interior, Paul helped create the Lowell National Historic Park, which I think is very cool. And among a number of accomplishments on the community front, he co-founded the Lowell Folk Festival and the Lowell Heritage Partnership. Paul, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Well, thank you for the invitation and uh, congratulations on this new form of communication within the uh, Franco-American community. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is doing it, but it's the first I've heard. Well, we're trying our best, for sure. There's, I know uh, Sandra Goodwin, who's somebody whose podcast I was doing, but hers is more geared towards genealogy. Um, but so there's a couple of us doing it, but thank you very much for joining us. This is very cool. Paul, where are you from? I was born in Lowell in 1954. Uh, my ancestors on both sides of my family emigrated from Quebec, uh, and landed in Lowell around 1880. Uh, my father's name, of course, Marion and my mother's family is Roy or before that, uh, Leroy or Le Roy. Uh, Interesting. And we you know on both sides uh, generally where they came from uh, in Normandy, uh, you know, toward the, uh, toward the coast, uh, you know, before making the jump to Canada. Sure. And obviously with this background, what role did the French-Canadian identity have in your life growing up? Well, it, it was a, a, a major part of, uh, you know, my experience as a young person. Uh, at the time, people, uh, you know, my father's and mother's generation was still fairly close to the root system. They both spoke French uh, to each other and sure. to uh, my grandparents. Uh you know, they would talk a little bit of French uh, to their uh, sisters and, and brothers. You know, that was the sort of transition generation. You know, even though I went to a French Catholic uh, elementary school and had, you know, French uh, every day, uh, you know, we were, you know, my generation was becoming, you know, Americanized. Uh, sure. we, were, we were the first sort of wave of suburban you know, Franco-Americans, you know, coming out of the sort of the urban parishes, uh, in our case, Lowell. Now, it's, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, you went to the French Catholic school. And, you know, my folks did as well, uh, the same year as you, in fact. Um, and their school day was taught half the day in French, half the day in English. Was that the same thing that happened down in Lowell? No, uh, not at our school. Uh, you know, we... We were in a uh, fairly new parish called St. Teresa, and it was uh, a parish named in honor of uh, St. Therese uh, of Lisieux, you know, who was a kind of rock star, you know, French, young French nun uh, who became a saint in the, uh, the early 20th century. The school was set up with strong French instruction. A few times we had... Uh, sisters of the Assumption who spoke only French. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but it was never a straight sort of one half French, one half English. You know, there was French class every day. There were a few periods where, you know, they, the Thursday was sort of French day and they teach, you know, geography in French. Interesting. Uh, but that wasn't the common. And by the time I got out of the eighth grade, you know, that was not happening. Gotcha. Okay, and what made you decide to have the telling of this French-Canadian-American identity like such a major, major part of your life? I was interested in history, 
sort of starting from from high school, it seemed to me important to know where you came from in order to figure out where you're going. Uh, And, you know, my, although I didn't know all the genealogical sort of tributaries when I was, when I was growing up, you know, I had a general sense that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the family, the extended family, the ancestors, you know, were connected to Quebec and Canada. And it was something uh, that made me distinctive. You know, it was, it was what gave some sort of color to my personality. If you could, I would like to talk a little bit about Lowell itself, because one of the things that we identified pretty early on in this project, it would be impossible to tell the story of the French Canadians in New England without talking quite a bit about Lowell. And you mentioned, obviously, how you're a fan of history. Can you just give us a thumbnail sketch of what what is the history of Lowell? Well, the, the history of Lowell, uh, of course, you know, Lowell uh, only became Lowell in the 1820s. Uh, before that, you know, the area was named for towns that had been settled in the 1640s. The, you know, the, the, the Puritan pilgrims came in 1620, and then about 20 years later, they moved into the Merrimack River Valley in the kinds of numbers where there could actually be towns. So you had Chelmsford and you know, where I ended up growing up after we left Lowell Drake it, you know, both named for places in England. But Lowell is there, you know, because it was a commercial venture, really, in the 1820s, driven by the availability of very powerful uh, river water uh, with the Pawtucket Falls, uh, you know, at that area in sure. Lowell. And uh, factory developers... Uh, who were trying to de- uh, create a, uh, a textile production industry in America seized on that location as a place to make what turned out to be the first, you know, significant planned industrial city in the United States. Before the Civil War, Lowell had the largest concentration of industry of anywhere in the United States. It's kind of hard to believe, but yeah, you know, right. there were there were no steel mills in Pittsburgh and no oil wells in Houston, uh, you know, there was shipbuilding along the coast, but, you know, in the 1820s and 30s, the concentration of five-story red brick factories in a kind of industrial park had just never been seen. You know, it then was replicated, and, you know, we saw it up and down the Merrimack Valley and throughout New England where there were rivers, but, you know, uh, from about 1822, you know, to the, about 1840, I mean, Lowell but it was nothing like it. It was like the uh, going to the Silicon Valley right. today. That's awesome. You know, it, w- it was high tech. Sure. And how is it that French Canadians enter our story? Well, that has to do with the economy and social changes in Quebec in the, the mid-1800s. You know, the French don't uh, come to Lowell in big numbers until after the American Civil War uh, as part of this larger migration where... You know, some 900,000 Quebec, you know, men and women decide that, you know, they need to leave the province and uh, find places to uh, live, work, you know, in, in New England to the, to the, to the south. Uh, and Lowell, because it had the sort of the factory cluster, you know, it was a very desirable uh, location. They needed uh, workers. Uh, there was there were jobs to be had. And uh, the population grew to the extent in by 1920, uh, <clears throat> French Canadian immigrants or you know American-born French uh, uh, root people uh, made up 20 percent of the of the city. They were like 25,000 people. No, that's awesome. And I know in, in Manchester, where I'm from. They were very heavily concentrated just on the west side of the river. And we talk, we've talked in a couple of our podcasts about the Little Canadas. Was there a specific area of Lowell that you could call the Little Canada? Not at first, because uh, as expected, you know, people came uh, off, they came on trains, whatever. And so there was uh, sort of settlement spread in a couple of different parts of the city. But eventually an enclave built up at the bend in the Merrimack River uh, today where uh, the uh, the Lowell Spinners ballpark is where the right. minor league Red Sox play. Yep. 
that that was a uh, a, a very dense district of tenements and businesses and it was said to be you know uh, in the late 1800s only second to uh, the hell's kitchen neighborhood in new york city wow for density uh, of people that's amazing i've been to that ballpark and had absolutely no idea that's so that, yeah that was once a you know completely you know filled with uh, tenements and businesses and then an urban renewal project uh in the early 1960s essentially demolished the whole area and scattered. A, by that time, there were probably about 3,000 uh, mostly French-Canadian people still living in the Little Canada section. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a dramatic blow to the coherence of the French community and the residual effects, you know, uh, you know, made a lot of change, you know, including, you know, the... Uh, uh, nearby, uh, the mother church, big stone cathedral type church, uh, St. Jean Baptiste, uh, eventually would close, you know, because the, uh, its parish base, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, scattered. No, and I kind of want to touch on that kind of the same theme because obviously I mentioned I'm from Manchester and a big, big deal in the history of our town is when Amoskeg finally, finally left. Yeah, and obviously that led to a significant period of transition and some difficulty for quite some time. Did I mean did Lowell experience the same kind of thing when the when the mills yeah, took well, off? Yeah, well, the uh, you know there's an adage in Lowell where they say the Great Depression arrived earlier and left later <laughs> in Lowell than any other place in yeah. the United States. Uh, a combination of factors led to most of the textile mill. Uh, corporations shutting down uh in low by the 1920s so you know you know some 10 years before you know the uh, the stock market crash the textile industry was already you know leaving low uh for a better situation uh oftentimes in the south uh where there was less unionization the energy had changed to steam so you didn't have to be near rivers and obviously the cotton you know, didn't have to be transported, you know, all the way up to New England. And so, in short order, many of the uh, textile jobs were, 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 were lost. And Lowell didn't really recover economically, you know, till the, uh, the late 1970s when the computer industry and Massachusetts Miracle, you know, sort of juiced up the Massachusetts economy again. But Lowell was really lagging. Gotcha. And obviously, this would have had a giant impact on the families of those French Canadians who came down to work in the mills. And we talked about the struggles of the Saint Jean Baptiste. And I'm curious what the French Canadian identity looks like in Lowell today. Uh, today, uh, well, you know, there's an older generation that continues, you know, to uh, support the Franco American week and, you know, annual activities and so forth. But, you know, it's a, it's a shadow of what it once was. No, I understand that. And so, can you tell us just briefly about what is Franco American Week? Because I'm always excited to hear when people are still throwing events to to tell the story of our French Canadian heritage. Yeah, that goes back to the 1970s when you know there was this general resurgence of identification with roots, partly because of the Roots TV series, but oh, wow. also the uh, the United States Bicentennial in 1976. There was a real uh, sort of reconnection, you know, whether it was Greek American, Irish American, Portuguese American, or, or the you know French Canadian Americans, um, and ever since then, I don't think they've ever missed a year. You know, there's been a Franco American Week, uh, uh, which includes uh, a flag raising ceremony at uh, at City Hall with a tradition they raise the the uh, uh, the province flag and, and Canadian flag. They have a banquet, you know, they usually have uh, a few cultural events where they, you know, may have, you know, French uh, singing groups. Uh, There's a tradition of choirs in Lowell that was very much associated with the Franco-American community. So there's often a kind of choir or choral, you know, uh, performance in one of the churches. You know, they mark the uh, uh, the connection, you know, to the to the past, and and celebrate, you know, what uh, is still 
you know, uh, a lively part of the community. But, you know, as I said, it's dramatically different than uh, than it was. And, you know, 40 years on, e- even the, the founders of the Franco-American Week, uh, you know, are, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're 40 years older. I do want to yeah. transition talking about uh, the Lowell National Historical Park because I've been a couple times, though it's yep. been about five years. Uh, i got to get myself back. It is an awesome place for anybody who has not gone yet. I think by far my favorite part, the coolest thing, was when you get into that room that actually has all the uh, the looms going. Yeah. Because it, it absolutely blew my mind was just how loud it was. Like, you read about yeah. how loud looms were, but to actually be in a room, and you know that's only a fraction of the amount of looms that would have been there in these giant mills, and just to hear that noise, something I yeah. definitely still remember without question. Now, right. so what was that process of, of putting that part together? Well, you know, it was part of the general uh, sort of revival of the city, you know, by the late 1960s, uh, and, and this was spurred partly by the... Uh, the demolition of Little Canada was a sort of a visual shock, you know, to, to see a neighborhood, uh, you know, decimated like that. Uh, there were also some historic buildings that were torn down. And so there were, uh, you know, people in the community who said, we can't just keep destroying our past. Uh, and there was a movement that started at the grassroots to rediscover the greatness uh, of the history that is reported in every, you know, U.S. history right. book. You know, you're going to find, you know, Lowell was Absolutely. the you know, beginning of the American Industrial Revolution. And so they seized on that. And uh, through the political system, both at the state level and at the federal level, the advocates were able to get legislation passed. Uh, and uh, Lowell was first designated uh, a heritage state park, which was a... a a group of these sort of uh, older cities, you know, that were being uh, uh, sort of rehabbed and uh, history was a, a theme. Uh, Lowell, I believe, was the first one. That was 1975 in mm-hmm. Massachusetts. And then in 1978, the legislation uh, passed in Congress to make Lowell, you know, a national park on the same list as the Grand Canyon and the Statue of Liberty and yeah. Gettysburg Battlefield. Uh, and Jimmy Carter signed the legislation, uh, and it came with a budget, uh, an, an initial budget of $40 million. Uh, it was very innovative at the time because the federal government, you know, unlike with a national park in Montana, they didn't buy up, you know, like 10,000 acres. Uh, they only bought five buildings, and uh, the, the challenge was how can you sort of make Lowell present itself, you know, as a a, a national park site, you know, offer programs that are, you know, at the level that are expected. And so, you know, it took about 10 years to get most of the big pieces in place. You know, Lowell, uh, you know, now, you know, there's like 400 buildings that have been restored. Yeah, that's awesome. uh, Some of it through incentives of federal grants and loans. And the national park, uh, you know, draws hundreds of thousands of visitors and what some people don't realize is there was a, a dual rationale uh, for making Lowell a national park. Uh, number one was, of course, the existence of, you know, sort of the artifacts of sure. the Industrial Revolution, the canal system uh, and the mills and the gatehouses and some of the early structures. But the second rationale was that the culture of the people who had come to work in the mills still existed in the neighborhoods of Lowell, and that was uh, identified as a national resource, as, as an asset to be preserved and celebrated. So that's why, you know, we have, you know, the big successful Lowell Folk Festival, right. uh, which is really a, a kind of tribute to American pluralism. You know, and Lowell is a kind of micro, uh, uh, you know, kind of prototype, you know, of, of, of that, you know, because... You know, you know, pick a number. There's, you know, 50, 60, 70 different ethnic and racial groups in Lowell. Sure. And actually, one thing that you mentioned that I do want to touch upon that's different. It was a surprise to me, honestly, when I went down there because it's different than Manchester where I'm from, is that the, the canals, uh, those are still there in Lowell. Those were, yeah. They're not there in Manchester anymore. Right. Yeah, that was, that was what, you know, that was one of the strongest 
arguments for making Lowell a national park was that the the engineering marvel of the power canal system, 5.6 miles of canals that bring river water, you know, down into the core of the city, you know, originally to to run the water wheels and the the turbines, uh, that still existed. That wasn't covered over. Uh, and and so you had that as a, as a starting point. Uh, and, you know, today they still generate you know, some electricity. Uh, there's a new move on. It's called the Lowell Waterways Vitality Project to uh, uh, kind of do more with the canals, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, a little bit of a cue from what's happened in Providence, Rhode Island with Water Fire, yeah. where they've made just this fantastic, you know, series of public events uh, yeah, right. using the inner city river, you know, as the organizing principle, you know, for these regular uh, evening celebrations. So, uh, you know, we started lighting uh, sections of the canal with LED lighting, uh, and uh, that's very popular. And, you know, I, I hopefully within five years, the whole system is going to be uh, lit up and, uh, you know, Lowell will have this, you know, very special nighttime attraction. Uh, one of the uh, steel bridges uh, last summer, I think it was, was uh, illuminated. Uh, uh, there was a donor who gave several hundred thousand dollars and, you know, again, using LED light technology, uh, there's a whole like computer generated lighting system and it just looks fantastic and it shows what could happen, you know, if you do other bridges and then get all the canals lit up. Sure. No, that's awesome. Now I would like to transition uh, to talking about your work. If at any point, Paul, you would come up, we touch upon a poem that you want to read, by all means, cut me off and we can do that. I'm just, okay. I'm just putting out the, uh, if you don't have to, just give me the invitation because I think that would be really neat. Let me, you know, since we're, uh, we're podcasting, let me read, a. Uh, you know, a, a kind of media piece uh, that is one of my better known poems dealing with, uh, you know, French Canadian American identity. It's a poem called Parlez Vous. Yeah. So the impetus uh, for writing this was uh, just a coincidental uh, sort of hearing on uh, the radio a, uh, a, a broadcast from Montreal, a sports talk show, uh, and it sort of takes off from there. Uh, the, the, the Pierre Bouchard was a Montreal Canadiens hockey player, so it was his talk show. Awesome. So he, here goes. Pierre Bouchard's sports talk radio show finds its way from Montreal to my room, the chatty French fading in and out. I'm picking up key words, leaning toward the Panasonic solid-state portable radio. In the dark, I reached over to fine-tune a Boston station and on the signal's edge, caught a Canadian phone call in mid-flight. The cold, clear December air, a blue net. The stars, like a connect-the-dots game, transmitting my root tongue, language of those who carried my name down and down through Quebec backwoods villages, down through Pinecone valleys, to this mill town whose brick factories make a great red wall along the river. Bouchard and his callers talk football, hockey, a commercial praises lovely Montreal, Paris of North America, cosmopolitan hive. They wish each other joyeux Noël, voices blinking slowly like fancy tree lights. That's awesome. So that poem's uh, uh, been well-received, been reprinted in a couple of anthologies of Franco-American writers, one when it was uh, published in Louisiana, another one uh, in Maine. No, and that, and you can get that in Union River. Absolutely, yeah. My latest uh, book of poems is called Union River Poems and Sketches. Uh, it's available on our Amazon, uh, and uh, uh, you know, people uh, can see what I've been writing. It's a kind of retrospective of 40 years of, of writing, uh, but uh, there's a, a long section that sort of related to, the, to my Lowell experience. Uh, but it's really a, an American book. Uh, I called it a, 
lyrical address, State of the Union address, you know, from me. Sure. Yeah, it's actually sitting right in front of me right now as we're doing this podcast. And oh, we good. can absolutely put a link for it on our, our social media so people can Oh, that'd be great, yeah. It. Now, why'd you call it Union River? Well, as I said, I, I wanted this book to be a kind of American book uh, and uh, written, you know, a lot about like Lowell and New England, but I also, you know, have been other places in the United States. I lived in California a little bit. I think of myself as an American writer, you no, know, not just a, a local or a regional writer. And this was a, an opportunity to sort of pull work together that some of it was, you know, not as well known and uh, present a kind of, you know, retrospective of my work, you know, since, uh, you know, the, the 1970s. Uh, the, the, the name Union River actually came to me because I knew about a small river in Maine. I used to go visit a friend up there, and uh, it was the Union River, and I always thought, well, that's a great name, you know, because it's sort of, uh, I mean, to me, it sort of said America without saying America. You know, this idea of unity, particularly in uh, this very chaotic and fractious uh, political time, I thought was really important. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, it was a good time to sort of say something about, you know, the country at large. No, that's awesome. And I did want to touch upon a piece in there called Climbing the Tenement Stairs. Which oh, I, yes. Which yeah. I thought was really, really cool, which you kind of tell the, the history of your family. Yeah, in a way, it's a capsule, you know, of my family. The, the title uh, comes from, there's a, I think I mentioned in there of uh, my mother being scalded, it, you know, uh, spilling some uh, boil, boiling water on herself. And, and my father went to see a local man that people believed could heal people. Uh, yeah. He was a kind of like French Canadian medicine man. And so my father went to see him and asked him if he could, you know, say some prayers or uh, cast a spell or I don't know what he did, <laughs> but whatever he could do to kind of uh, help with the healing of uh, my mother. You know, she did recover. You know, it was one of those, uh, you know, very, it was like an unforgettable anecdote that I heard as a kid. I, when I wrote that, uh, I was sort of uh, summarizing a lo lot of uh, these sort of, you know, stories that had come down to me, you know, from, you know, the grandparents and, and even, you know, beyond, you know, was it was part of me trying to sort of connect, you know, with, you know, my origins. Sure. And one of the things I thought was interesting, the story you tell about when your mother was a girl in Centralville, I, get, I hope I got that. She, yeah, they, they pronounce it uh, Centerville. You know, uh, but it's it's spelled Centralville, but it's it's said like it's Centerville, yeah. In that she would not cross the bridge. Oh yeah. To the enclave yeah. that was considered low class French, which I think is funny that there was like a almost a class disparity among the French Canadians themselves. Yeah, well, you know, like like human beings everywhere, you know, people uh, self sort, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, there, there was a kind of three-tier stratification, you know, as I understood it during the, you know, sort of middle of, you know, the 20th century, you know, where people of lesser means were in little Canada, you know, living in the tenements. And then those, you know, who were doing a little bit better were across the river in Centerville, which is where Jack Kerouac was born and first lived. And then, but they were mostly renters, you know, o over there. Uh, and then if you were doing a little bit better than that, you moved over to uh, Pawtucketville, where Kerouac later moved. And there there might even be a chance, you know, if you were French to own a home, own, own your first home. And, uh, you know, parts of Pawtucketville, the outer section, you know, were a little bit more uh, sort of suburban feeling with yards and so forth. So, you know, there was a kind of the inner city, the, the, the middle zone and and then the you know the, the step up and then if you were really well off well you could be living with you know all the wealthier people in the belvedere neighborhood which uh, didn't have a particular ethnic I identity you know but uh you know if you were in little canada you were at saint john baptiste you know the mother church you know where there were thousands of people going to mass every day uh, you know, at least on sundays yeah. uh and then in centerville there was the saint louis de france parish 
and then in Pawtucketville, the St. John d'Arc. Uh, you know, so those were the sort of, you know, the, the French anchors. Which is super interesting. This is the first I'm getting this story. This is awesome. And I'm curious if as you moved away from that that inner city and then towards Pawtucketville, was there... Was there a difference in how the French Canadian identity evolved, changed in those different areas? I don't, th- I don't think so in general. Again, because you know, really up until like the sort of the middle nineteen sixties, it was pretty saturated identity wherever you were. Uh, mostly because you know people were still going to church in big numbers, and the sure. parish was a kind of organizing principle, um, and then. The economics didn't have a, a major impact. In fact, you know, if you were upper middle class, you maybe had a little bit more time to get involved in like social activities gotcha. and, and 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 you know Franco American affairs in the city uh, or you know politics uh, and and so uh, you know there, there there wasn't in my sense a diminishment of identity uh, related to the. Uh, uh, you know, sort of economic status. Sure. Oh, that's cool. One thing that you did mention also uh, in the same work was something that I found semi amusing because it was absolutely something that stories that I've been told of these marathon card games that would seemingly go oh, yeah. on go on forever, and sometimes yeah. you even include multiple houses involved in this. I mean, is that is that a story that you were told frequently growing up? Well, I mean, I I knew of it was it was one of the sort of social glue activities again when i was growing up you know playing cards right. you know was uh, a, a kind of uh, you know recreational activity that connected people they would go to each other's house play cards you know have some drinks listen to music you know there's, there's still a, a, a you know i don't participate in it but you know my understanding is there's still a strong card playing subculture in the Merrimack Valley there's a game called 45s I don't know if they play that up in Manchester I'm not familiar uh, with it but you know that that's a popular kind of local game yeah card playing was uh, it was a kind of uh, you know universal activity uh, again you know you could get out to the social club sure. and whether you worked at the bank or you worked in the mill you know, you could sit down and play cards. Everybody was, in a sense, speaking the same, you know, recreational language. Now I gotta look up this forty fives. I'm curious now because I've always, oh, yeah. I've always been told stories of marathon bid whist tournaments. That's the big one. Yeah, we remember. like uh, when I was growing up. One of the uh, you know sort of popular games was canasta. You know, where yeah. you know you needed two decks of cards, uh, and I used to play that with my my French uh, grandparents. Sure. Now, you you also mentioned that New Year's Day meant pork pie, and that's something that's come up in many of our podcasts that we've talked about so far. People have different words for it. My family, we called it pork pie. Uh, my folks' family, they always called it turkey. Yeah. But it was always around. Is that something that still ends up on your dinner table holiday time? It's something I might buy. It's not something that I make. I was once interviewed by the Boston Globe about the whole Franco-American thing, and one of the things I said was, you know, again, my observation was, you know, as uh, sort of identity begins to sort of drain out uh, of people or, or you know, communities, it seems like, you know, there's a sequence where the kind of the national parish, you know, goes, and then uh, the language goes... Uh, and then uh, there's the food. Yep. And the food seems to be the most stubborn uh, <laughs> as, as far like as that. hanging around for, you know, some kind of evidence of particular identity. And, you know, it might be true whether you're, you know, Portuguese or Polish or Italian or, or Irish. But we, you know, one of the things I miss having moved to Amesbury is a, uh, a wonderful small market in Lowell Cody's market that made all of the home style sort of homemade sure. uh, Franco-American foods that I grew up with and even that were served in the cafeteria at my French 
Catholic school when I was, I was growing up. So <laughs> you could go to Cody's, and it's still there. You know, say, the, yeah. the, the ownership has changed. It's it's on Salem Street in Lowell. You could get pork scrap or corton or corton, corton however you want to <laughs> yeah, say corton, that. Yeah, corton, yeah. That's yeah, the best. Yeah, and, uh, and the, you know, the pork and salmon pies. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, this sort of oddball thing called Chinese pie. Absolutely. You know, which pate chinois which, you know, I write about in one of my books, uh, trying to figure out how that became a Franco-American specialty. But then, you know, my mother would make Chinese chop suey as a, as a Franco-American specialty. <laughs> you know, awesome. it's like, I, I, don't, I, I don't know where that came from. In, in a sense, like a, a contemporary museum to go into Cody's and see all these foods that were made every day and uh, and people were buying them. And, and the most famous was what they call low beans, and they had a uh, a special recipe from a, a market called Rochette's Market that uh, uh, became kind of the uh, the ultimate baked bean uh, in uh, in Lowell. And it wasn't your typical Boston baked bean with dark beans with right. molasses. It was a it was a light bean uh, recipe with uh, a kind of pork and tomato and ketchup, uh, <laughs> as I understand it, you know, uh, sauce. People just couldn't get enough of that at uh, at Cody's Market. There is a small market with a French name here in Ainsbury called Vermettes that does that does sell uh, Coton or Creton, uh, yes. uh, but not some of the other uh, you know French homemade specialties that I I know about. Well, you've talked me into it for sure. When I go down this summer to visit the historic oh, yeah. park, stop I'm going to stop at Cody's. See, yeah, the owner uh, is Roger Legassi. I mean he. He, you know, he taught the new owner, you know, a lot of the recipes that the customers, you know, want. So I left just as they were transitioning. So, you know, I, I hope they're still doing great. No, that's cool. And in this, sorry, one more thing about this particular work, which I thought was funny. You've actually alluded to it because you trace back your your personal history all the way back to Normandy. And you mentioned for a long time earlier in this interview, you mentioned that you didn't necessarily know your history. Like, How long did that take to be able to dig up? That genealogy on you know, both sides of your family back to the same area of France. Right. I didn't know much other than this sort of vague, you know, we came from Canada, you know, until high school, you know, and then high school, I got more tuned to sort of the personal family history. Uh, it turned out that uh, I had aunts, one on both sides of the family, that did all the genealogical nice. tracing. You know, in a general way, you know, sure. not not down to the fine grains, but, you know, they were able to find, you know, the marriage records, you know, back to the mid-1600s in uh, in Normandy, uh, uh, toward the coast, places like Dieppe and, and near Enfleur. And I went to Normandy for the first time in the fall of 2017. Oh, wow. Uh, and it was just a fantastic trip. Uh I had no idea that it would look like Nebraska because <laughs> it's all this farmland going up the Seine. But then, you know, we, we you know, we went up as far, as far as the English Channel. It wasn't, well, other than like the area around Enfleur, it wasn't the primary area that my ancestors came from. But it gave me, a you know, a very good sense sure. of like, you know, what did Normandy, you know, the, the villages, the farms and, and the, you know, the historic structures, you know, what they looked like, uh, you know, on the ground. So it, w- it was a great, uh, it was a great trip. That's awesome. Now, another of your pieces from the same Union River um, book is the sandbank on Riverside. And oh, I, yeah. I thought that was interesting because you mentioned that it was for, I hope I get this pronunciation right or even come close, Francois oh, Pelletier. Francois Pelletier. And now, yeah. who, who is, and his voyageurs, who is Francois yeah. and what are his voyageurs? Well, it's interesting uh, in terms of my own sort of French-Canadian journey. Uh, you know, although I was uh, involved to a certain degree in the kind of Franco-American cultural revival in general, uh, it was really the, uh, through Jack Kerouac that... Uh, I found a, a path toward, you know, actually going back to Canada, uh, and in the process of, uh, you know, working to 
lift up Kerouac's name and legacy in Lowell, I came in contact with writers and poets in Quebec, Montreal, Quebec City, who were, you know, Kerouac nuts. Uh, and, uh, you know, they started to come, you know, once we had a kind of Kerouac infrastructure with a festival and the Kerouac commemorative, they started to come down, uh, uh, you know, on a regular basis, not every year, but, you know, maybe every couple of years. And I got to know them, and, and there was a kind of team, you know, including the, the poet uh, 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 Francois Pelletier. There was a bookstore owner who's also a writer and musician, Richard uh, Gingra, Gingras, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, half dozen more. And got to know them and then actually got invited by them to participate in the Montreal Literary Festival. That's awesome. Uh, you know, back about 10 years, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I also got invited uh, to Moncton in New Brunswick uh, to be part of the Northrop Fry Literary Festival. Uh, so, you know, it was a kind of, you know, a reciprocal thing. You know, Kerouac became a kind of transmission uh, vehicle, you know, for me uh, to reconnect with the French Canadians today, sure. you know, up, up there. Uh, and the, 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 the poem, the prose poem, the sandbank on Riverside is about one of their visits where we went over to the uh, area in the Pawtucketville neighborhood where Kerouac had grown up. There's, you know, sort of the remains of a feature, you know, uh, it's an actual sandbank, I guess, from when the river actually was high enough to, that, you know, it sort of flooded up to there, you know, in, you know, the glacial times or something. Mm -hmm. But it was a playground area for Kerouac and he writes about it and so we went to the sand bank and they you know filled up little containers of sand to take back to uh, Quebec with them that's very cool and I was able in, in the you know in the prose poem you know I was able to kind of use that incident to kind of recap you know going back to Champlain you know coming up uh, you know, at the, uh, uh, the the mouth of the Merrimack River, you know, as the, the, you know, the French explorer in New England, you know, sort of recap, you know, the whole French experience in Lowell, you know, through, you know, their uh, sort of ritual visiting of, of the Kerouac site. Yeah, that's very awesome. Now, another piece in the same, same book is the, the cut from American cloth. Yeah. And I wanted to mention this one because something you wrote in that is that your wife is of Irish heritage. Yeah. And I'm curious because in Manchester you hear stories of the French first Irish thing big time. There was a big yeah. time rivalry. Was that the same in Lowell? Well, you know, in 1920, you know, maybe there were uh, rivalries, neighborhood rivalries with sure. the, uh, the, 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 the French uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the Irish, you know, would... Uh, Get in battles on the uh, on the common or something like that, but uh, you know that's all you know pretty much in the past. Uh, it, you know it it did manifest in uh, political activity in the city because when the French arrived, the Irish had ascended in the city to the point where they had control of democratic politics. Uh, you know, for a lot of practical reasons. And the French were new, you know, slowly becoming, you know, citizens, right. getting naturalized, uh, you know, the ones born, you know, 21 years later, you know, registering to vote. Uh, but it took a while for the French to have a kind of political, critical mass. And one of the things that happened is uh, they gravitated toward the Republican Party as a way to counter the Democratic well, the Irish, you know, control of the democratic uh, process uh, and the the old, you know, Yankees or English, uh, you know, they were sort of the Republican core. But then the French, you know, aligned with them as a way to balance the, uh, you know, sort of voting power in uh, in the city. Uh, and it worked to a certain extent. And and for a long time, if you were French, you were Republican in Lowell. Uh, that only really started to change, you know, during the Great Depression with Franklin Roosevelt. Gotcha. When, you know, people like my parents, you know, working class Franco-Americans realized that the Democratic, you know, political agenda was going to be much better for them, you know, with social programs sure. and support, you know, for the, uh, you know, for the little guy. 
Okay, and what is the Canadian Sausage Company of Lowell? Well, that's gone now, but it was a uh, uh, basically a, 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 a meat and butchering uh, you know company. They had their own line of sausages that they, they made. You know, uh, in the uh, uh, my my recollection is it you know the uh, the plant. It was really more like a garage, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know that was in a neighborhood. You know, so it wasn't like some big warehouse factory operation. Uh, but what was distinctive is they had these uh, uh, red uh, trucks. You know, with their name on them, uh, red and white trucks that would you know go around the city delivering you know, to the markets and grocery stores, uh, you know, that had customers who, who wanted, you know, these, uh, these special meats, some of them, you know, the French Canadian sort of specialties that, you know, blood sausage or head cheese or things that, you know, not something I would go looking for. Uh, but, uh, but they were, you know, but their main line was, uh, was sausage making, uh, pork sausages. That's awesome. And like, before we move on from Union River, I do want to touch upon, um, well, it's funny, before we started talking, uh, Mike and I were chatting about maybe what my favorite piece was, and I think it's, do you ever think you'd go back? And I think that's kind of cool. Oh, yes, I yeah, go, my I, father would say that. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, and, you know, I never really thought, what the heck does he mean by that, <laughs> you know? It, you know, it, you know, it's sort of like, uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like a zen, you know, a zen riddle. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was able to use it, you know, to write about, uh, you know, kind of think about, you know, kind of bigger questions about who we are, where we're going, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, the kind of thing, you know, that poetry is for, right? The, the big questions. It, it's because it has the line and I actually, I wrote this one down because I, I had to make sure to mention it, that a friend of mine says we can go back to a place, but not back to a place in time. And yeah. I thought that was way cool. Yeah, you know, it seems so obvious, right? But uh, sometimes you have to write it down to really get it because no matter how astute a historic preservation activist you are, you know, we, we haven't figured out yet how to recover time. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know? Uh, and uh, in writing, you know, there's a, uh, there's an attempt in, in, in some cases, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of uh, you're battling time, you know, and you, you write about something and in a sense you make it eternal, you know, as a written thing. But, you know, the, the actual experience, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we, there, there's no time machine. No, of course. And another one more while I get you that I definitely need to talk about is, is this was the other book that's sitting in front of me right now, which is the French class. Oh, yeah. French, Canadian, American writings on identity, culture, and place. And right. one thing I think is kind of cool, uh, we've spent a lot of time on this podcast already with multiple people um, coming up with, you know, the words that we call ourselves. And throughout this and throughout a lot of works, you refer to, you don't say Franco-American, you say French-Canadian-American, which I think is kind of cool. And what made you just kind of choose that language? Yeah, that's that's a kind of private campaign of mine, Uh and, you know, it's not to be a wise guy. It's just the term Franco-American is is broad, right? I mean, yeah. you, you know, they, I mean, it could cover any sort of Francophile person or a person from, you know, Lu, Lu, you know, who is like Cajun, whatever. Sure. You know, if you're Cajun, you're not French Canadian. You know, if you're Haitian, French, you're not French Canadian. You know, if you're, you know, and they're not a lot, but if you're an actual French uh immigrant, although I hear, uh, you know, French are now moving into Quebec, you know, for for reasons of uh, social mobility or something. But I thought, you know, distinctively, you know, New England is this idea of French Canadian American. Uh, and, and it was, I just thought, you know, I'm going to underline that, you know, as a way to, you know, kind of make a point about my particular group. Sure. And just when it comes to this book itself you're one of four contributors how did you guys all get together for this uh paul brulette uh i grew up with uh so i you know i i knew him i learned about uh susan april she's a little bit younger than me but uh through kind of the writing world i i learned 
that uh, you know she was writing poems and and and, and fiction. And then Marie Louise Saint Ange, we met you know somewhere in kind of the cultural happenings in Lowell. You know she 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 grew, she grew up in Lowell. She lives in Maine now. And and so I was taking a, I went to graduate school late in life, and I was taking a course in ethnic and racial factors in the community. And I proposed to the professor that I. Uh, edit this book as as a uh, uh, like a semester long uh, special project uh, and to get credit and and they agreed and so I reached out to uh, Paul and Susan and Marie Louise uh, because I I knew we were all you know approximately the same age and same sort of ethnic experience you know this sure. this sort of uh, uh, you know, highly assimilated, but uh, acutely aware type persons, uh, and and so you know we got together and kind of as a group, you know, we we uh, we put together this collaboration, and it was published in 1999, and it was uh, uh, did well. It was adopted for you know uh, Franco American Studies and New England Studies uh, courses at Keene State College at UMass Lowell. Uh, a college in in uh, Rhode Island, uh, but it didn't really take off, you know. So it eventually went out of print. Uh, I think it's an important book, uh, and you know, we were trying to say something about who we were at that time, yeah. you know, in this flow of uh, you know ethnic uh, identification, in a sense, staking our claim as French Canadian Americans. Even though you know we you know we might not have looked that way, if sure. you could say look that way, you know, because because you know we looked more American than French. Gotcha. There's a couple of pieces I do want to mention here. The first we've kind of semi alluded to the topic of which anyway we've alluded to. You actually have a piece on Chinese pie, which I thought was kind of cool. That's right. Because yeah, I was for I me, was, I was working out the uh, the. You know the mysterious origins. <laughs> yeah, which is funny because I have to confess I, I grew up with I've eaten Chinese pie in my house quite a bit growing up, but I did had no idea it had French Canadian origin until I started working on this project. That yeah. was something I discovered. I thought it was just kind of a weird thing my family did, but no, it's it's a big yeah. Well, you know, the, you know, maybe not your family, but uh, you know, it had this French name, right, pâté chinois, and uh, and I remember seeing it. You know, on the menus in Quebec City when I went up there a number of years ago, uh, which which I thought you know was uh, amazing and uh, and seems to be one of the few uh, sort of reverse uh, uh, travel uh, experiences you know for the uh, uh, the people who left to send something back up this recipe for uh, pate chinois. That's awesome. And the final piece I did want to touch on, and I think this is kind of a cool way to go out, is something uh, is a piece called New Pine Hill. Which oh, I, yeah. Which I thought was odd. And it's, you highlight a conversation with a gentleman who's kind of, you know, first of all, you look to the like Little Canada Memorial, and yeah. then you have, like, a discussion with a gentleman kind of almost like about reminiscing of the good old days in the neighborhood. And it's, and it's really cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, New Pine Hill. It was, you know, people are like, where did poems come from? Well, you know, that was a real conversation. I met, you know, just bumped into this guy going to the parking lot. You know, I said, uh, you know, how do you like, you know, how it looks? Because there was a new landscape kind of cleaned up area along the canal and what was the Little Canada. And he said, oh, I liked it better the way it was. Yeah. And then that opened up a whole... Uh, kind of conversation and and sort of memory trip for me uh, because I was old enough to remember you know what was there before the uh, uh, the demolition uh, and then it was a kind of meditation on uh, you know preserving identity uh, you know trying to you know sort of honor social history and at the same time you know recognize the reality of change. I cannot thank you. I can do this forever. This could be the, the never-ending interview. I've had an absolute blast. Thank you so much for joining us here, Paul. Thanks for inviting me, Jeffy. Uh, you know, good luck with this. Uh, let me know, you know, when it goes live. Sure. I'll get it around, you know, through my social media, uh, you know, network. And, 
you know, maybe, you know, as you keep going, you know, a couple of years from now or something, I can come back and, you know, we can do it again. I think we're going to have to do that. Before we go, where can listeners get a hold of Union River if they want to purchase that? Yeah, the, my Union River book is available on Amazon.com, like every other book in the universe. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, that's probably the, the, the best way to, to get it. It's also available at Small Press Distribution. Uh, which which is a, a, a big broker of uh, small uh, publishers, uh, and it's available on my own publishing company website, loompress.com. But p- people might you know find uh, Amazon the, the 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 easiest route because uh, they're used to using that. Gotcha. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely would love to do this again. We didn't even really touch upon Kerouac, which who probably deserves his own episode one time where we could chat about him. That'd be really neat. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a good evening. Uh, good night, Jesse. Bye. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, so our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fclpodcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode. This program is recorded at the Conquer TV podcasting studio. The views and opinions expressed during this podcast are not necessarily those of Conquer TV. The producer is solely responsible for its content.